Hello everyone, welcome back to the weekly Armchair Kickoff podcast. And um, this morning we are joined by Rob Dawson and um, from ESPN. He is the Manchester United and Manchester City correspondent. And also this morning we are joined by Callum from Football CFB, and um, he is a podcast regular. And um, so this morning we are talking about um, Manchester United, and um, specifically this morning. And um, today is the first edition of the Keen on United show, and um, this will be a regular um, going forward every week as well as the normal podcasts. And um, so Rob. Um, firstly, just talking about your career with ESPN, um, you're, also, you're, you're covering Manchester United and Manchester City um, for quite some time. Um, how did that develop your career with ESPN and like, what gave, gave you the motivation to kind of go into journalism and kind of football in general? Um, well, I, I suppose like lots of young lads, I'm a failed footballer, wanted to be a footballer, um, never really happened, wanted to stay in the game um, and then... When it all kind of ended, I went back to university to do a journalism degree. Um, was very, very lucky to get a job almost straight away um, at the Manchester Evening News, which yeah. is obviously where I grew up in Manchester. Um, particularly fortunate that they were just hiring at the time because it can be quite a challenging industry to get into. Um, obviously, lucky, yeah, lucky to take that job. Spent um, nearly 10 years at the Manchester Evening News and, and when the job at ESPN came up, I felt it was a time for a change and um, it's been great. You know, ESPN are probably not that well known in, in England and, and Ireland perhaps as they are in America. Obviously it's an American broadcasting company, but um, they've been great and they, they're trying to break into to covering the, the Premier League and, um, and doing a, a very good job of it at the moment. Yeah. Um, like I've seen, obviously I've seen yourself on the YouTube clips. Like I watch ESPN though. I watch Sky Sports. I watch BT Sport. And I'd, I'd kind of watch all different kind of platforms for football and kind of Manchester United just in general to kind of get dope different perspectives and different spins you know, on football itself. And like, I think yeah, ESPN's like coverage is very good. Like how, I like how they analyze stuff in terms of like football and to have all the different personalities and stuff like that that they have on. It's a, it's a very good, it's a very good channel. And I think, especially, I think they made, may break into Ireland and the UK scene though, as time goes on. Um, Rob, with relation obviously to Manchester United, um, how would you assess kind of, Oli got a Solskjaer's um, tenure as manager um, and how do you think he's getting on so far? Yeah, I mean, when you look at it overall, it's, it's probably quite difficult to judge as, as one, one career, really, one reign, because as he came in as a caretaker manager, it went very well from, from the start. When that run ended, um, it seemed to, to fall apart quite quickly for a, a number of different reasons. Um, I must say there was, there was a little bit of concern among the, the journalists who kind of followed United last summer that we weren't really sure what to expect with a new season. We weren't really sure whether to expect um, you know, a similar run of results as we saw right at the start of Solskjaer's reign or, or a continuation of the, the poor form that they showed at the end of last season. Um, obviously, the start of this season has been a little bit inconsistent. I think they had some great results. They had some absolutely awful results, some quite poor performances, really. But, you know, since, since January, since Bruno Fernandes has come in, you know, you can't really fault the... Um, the form and, and the, the way they've played, you know, particularly the way they've come back after the break. You know, the, the break in the season was, was tough, I think, for all teams because it was something that, that they'd never really had to deal with before. You know, no one had to kind of... Yeah. Um, it's something that they, they would never have to... Have, they would never have expected. It. There was no kind of precedent for how to cope with that. I think the way they've come back from that and really made a charge for those top four places is um, they deserve a lot of credit for that. And, you know, hopefully from, from United's point of view, from Solskjaer's point of view, they can go and finish the job you know, maybe reach an FA Cup final, get into the Champions League next season and then, you know, concentrate fully on the Europa League in August. And in terms of, like, Ollie's recruitment, like, he's brought in Dan James, Aaron Mambasaka, Harry Maguire, Bruno Fernandes. Like, how would you kind of assess, like, the recruitment side of things? Like, he's trying to build kind of a, a good culture within the dressing room and kind of get, you know, great attitudes in there and kind of players who want to kind of play for the badge more kind of from the money, kind of financial financial side of things. Like, how do you think he's building that? Yeah, I mean, he's done. I mean, that's that's one area that, that he's done particularly well. I mean, I wouldn't just give the credit to to Ollie. I would give the credit to the, the club in general. I think the club, the recruitment team, Ed Woodward, have looked at the recruitment side of things at Man United and realised that that wasn't good enough. You know, there's been a lot of kind of haphazard signings, you know, a scattergun approach to recruitment where you're kind of just looking for players who, who are available and bringing them in for a lot of money and it hasn't worked. Um, when Ollie came in, they decided to, to revamp the way they recruited players. Ollie had a very clear vision of the type of player that he wanted to come in. 
you know, lots of these players are, are young, um, British, they've got Premier League experience. Um, and I think that will carry on. That's the kind of the, the mould that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wants in the players that he brings to the club. Um, you know, the ones that he has signed, you know, the, the, the names you've mentioned there, I don't think there's a, a failure among them. You know, United as a club aim for about a, a 70% success rate with signings because they know that not every signing is going to come off. You know, so far with the, the names that, that Ollie's brought to the club, you'd have to say that he's, he's getting close to sort of a 100% success rate. And if that was to carry on next, next summer with the names they'd bring in in the next transfer window, they would have a very, very good chance of, of building a team that were capable of, of possibly ch- challenging for the Premier League title again, which is obviously where they want to get to. Can I just ask Rob about Mason Greenwood? You've been covering football for a number of years. In terms of his talent, just where does he rank in the young players you've watched come through over the years at this stage already? Because was it 16 goals for an 18-year-old? That's just sensational. Any level of football, never mind the Premier League. Yeah, I mean, in terms of where he's at right now, um, I would say he's probably about the best that I've seen. Um, you know, I, I didn't cover Wayne Rooney when he was coming through at, at Everton. Um, you know, obviously wasn't particularly aware of the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo when he was coming through at Sporting Lisbon but in terms of, of his age and his, his technical ability in particular for an 18 year old it's, it's something that I've never seen before um, you know, I've said it before in, in, on podcasts and on interviews and things that the fact that he is so comfortable on both sides with his right foot and his left foot um, I can't remember ever seeing that with a, a player who's, who's only 18 years old you know, he's someone that we've heard a lot about you know, whispers really from academy coaches in the past. You know, they're always trying to talk up their players and, and give us little hints and tips about who's the next one to watch out for. You know, we've, they've mentioned the likes of James Wilson, Adnan Yanazai in the past. Mason Greenwood was, was one of the ones they were talking about from the time he was sort of 12, 13. And, and one of the things they kept saying was that, you know, this kid, he can take penalties, free kicks and corners with both feet and you wouldn't be able to tell which one his stronger side is. And I think that's still true now. You know, um, I've, there was a game... Was it um, where he scored twice at Old Trafford recently? Bournemouth. Bournemouth, perhaps, yeah. Where he scored one, one with his right foot, one with his left foot. And you couldn't tell. You know, if you didn't know that he strung his foot with his left foot, you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, they were both incredible finishes. And for a kid of that age, and just to have that technical ability and to have that temperament in senior football is, is unbelievable. And, you know, if he carries on and develops the way that people expect him to be, I, I really, really think that you've got a chance of uh, Mason Greenwood being one of the best players in the world. Absolutely. And I think with Greenwood, like I watched him back when he's playing his younger days before he broke into the first team on MUTV and kind of watching the under 23 games and stuff like that. And the level of maturity he's shown in his game for that age is unbelievable. Like you look at players obviously in around that age who are also good, like like say Phil Foden, Joe Callum Hudson, Jaden Sancho, they're all good players in their own right. But looking at Mason Greenwood, he's just, I think he's a level above all them. He's He's shown a great maturity and I think as he gets older, maybe he hits the age of 23, 24. We're maybe even having, as Rob said, a different conversation as one, maybe he's maybe one of the best players in the world. I think at that age, we will be having that conversation come then. Um, yeah. So with regards to um, covering Man United, Rob, um, what was your favourite memory kind of covering United? Obviously, we've had big wins and so monumental moments um, as with Manchester United. Like, What's your favourite memory covering it? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, one of my favourites was the FA Cup final against Crystal Palace with with Louis Van Gaal. Um, obviously, it was a, it was quite a difficult day from a from a work standpoint, given that everything you know the, the stuff in the background about Jose Mourinho um, possibly coming in. Um, obviously, we we kind of got that news pretty soon after the final whistle. Um, but you know, just from a personal point of view, I was very happy for for Louis Van Gaal that that he ended. At Man United with a trophy. Um, obviously, it had been a while since since Sir Alex Ferguson had retired that United had won a trophy, and it was important for the club, but also important for him because you know I know a lot of fans would look back at the time that Louis Van Gaal had at Man United and not be particularly impressed. You know, there were problems clearly with the the, the way that the football was organised. The recruitment wasn't the best at times, but you know, from a, a purely human point of view, I always found Louis, um, you know, quite a nice, welcoming bloke. Um, I, I don't. I still don't think he deserved the end that he got at Man United. I'm, I'm not for a minute suggesting that he should have carried on, particularly, but you know, to be effectively sacked the day that he won the FA Cup, Man United, I don't think was right, and I, it left a little bit of a bad taste, to be honest. Um, so I was happy 
I was happy for him that day. You know, it was a, a great result for Man United. Happy for Jesse Lingard. It was an incredible goal. A local lad to come through the academy and score the winner in extra time at Wembley. Um, just a just a good day, um, apart from the stuff that happened afterwards with, with Louis, which I still think left a little bit of a bad taste. I've got to ask you about the, the David Moyes era because I've been lucky enough to speak to your, your good colleague, Mark Ogden, and he doesn't hold back on his opinion of, of David Moyes at that time. <laughs> what was it like covering United under Moyes? Because I always remember the Fulham game where I think United... Had some like 81 crosses, and you just 87, look at that. 87, 87 crosses it was, yeah. and you think, what is going on there? That's Sunday League stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, I must admit, I'll hold my hands up, and I thought that it was it was a fair appointment at the time. Um, you know, I thought that David Moyes had, had kind of done his time in the Premier League and, and maybe was ready for the step up. Um, so I, I didn't have any qualms really about the appointment when Sir Alex Ferguson retired, but it became apparent quite quickly that he wasn't. He just wasn't ready for the job. I don't think he was ready for a club the size of Man United. I think it actually took him by surprise. Um, you know, the the way that he kind of handled himself on on the first tour. Um, you know, there's a, a story that, that Mark Ogden's probably told you about going for a walk on a beach um, on the tour and, and not realising that the whole squad was just going to get swamped with thousands and thousands of fans. Um, it's just little things like that that make you think that he just wasn't really ready. Um, I can remember in a, in a corridor at West Brom being berated, being in a group of journalists who were being berated by David Moyes for something that seemed very, very sort of insignificant and small at the time. And again, you kind of come away from that thinking, you know, it doesn't really feel like you understand the size of this club and that the, every single eye in the world almost is on you and every decision that you make. And that's just what you sign up for at, at Man United. Um, I will say in, in David Moyes' defence that I think if you spoke to Ed Woodward now, I think he would probably say that they got a lot wrong behind the scenes for David. Um, I don't think he was given the best chance to succeed. Obviously, that summer's transfer window went so poorly. Um, I don't think you know, anyone at United felt that it was going to go as bad as that. Um, you know, Just to sign Marouane Fellaini and do it in the way that they did looked amateur, in my opinion. Um, it didn't help, obviously, that David Gill had gone at the same time and, and Ed Woodward came in at the same time as David Moyes and there was kind of a new hierarchy at Man United. So I don't think things behind the scenes hate, helped David Moyes particularly. I don't think he was given um, not the so trying to find the, the right word. I don't think he was given the, the right resources really to succeed but the way that he handled the job, the way that he handled senior players, um, the way that he went about managing Man United I don't think was right and I, I, you know, looking back obviously it was, it was the wrong appointment. And like I heard I, I don't know how true this is but I heard from his time at United that he was speaking, obviously, to senior players. I think it was Rio Ferdinand, Nemanja Vidic, and he was showing videos of Jag Yelka and Distan defending and saying this is how he should defend. Like, these is two centre-backs who have won multiple Premier League titles and Champions Leagues. Like, that must have been an insult right there. I'd say they might, they might have lost other respect for David Moyes at that point in time. Yeah, I mean, and you know, the, you know the, there are instances of, of things like that happening. I mean, I think it, it, was, it was very, very difficult for David Moyes to come in. It was a team that had won multiple... Premier League titles, you know, you've got very, very ex ex experienced senior pros, likes of Patrice Evra, um, you know, Ryan Giggs, Ferdinand Vidic, you know, a real core of players who were coming towards the end of their careers. Um, and I think he struggled in the way that, I don't think he, he really found a way of handling those personalities. Um, you know, it, it didn't go down particularly well that he got rid of almost all of Sir Alex Ferguson's backroom staff straight away. You know, there's a school of thought that he probably should have kept the assistants, you know, Rennie Muhlenstein, Mike Phelan should have been kept on and he shouldn't have brought his own men in um, or as many of his own men that, he, you know, he also should have kind of brought the senior pros with him a little bit more, you know, lent on them for advice a little bit more instead of sort of, sort of coming in and saying it's my way or the highway. Um, you know, I think he was given a little bit of a hospital pass in, in the way that, you know, the, the profile of the squad at the time, you know, it was a squad that was coming to the end of their cycle. You know, there, there was a huge rebuild to be done there. Um, and I don't think that did him any favours, but I think that David Moyes, you know, probably even if you ask him, if you look back, I think he would probably have done things differently. Also in his defence, you've got Jose Mourinho, who won a few trophies at Manchester United, but the end was, wasn't particularly great for him or the club. He recently this week referred to Manchester United as being a lucky football side at the moment in relation <laughs> to decisions. Is that a wee bit of envy from Jose at United's form compared to Spurs? Yeah, possible. I think Jose Mourinho is smart enough to have looked at the VAR overturned table that affects every Premier League club and realised that United are 
close to the top, if not the top of that list, and have, has, hasn't been able to resist a little a dig at his old club in true Jose um, form. Um, you know, I think that you know you'll have seen Jose enough, the same as I have, to know that he never lets a chance slip by without having a little bit of needle. Um, and I'm sure that he kind of relished the chance to say that in his press conferences. You know, I think, you know, United, I think United have been fortunate in some instances. I think they've been unfortunate in others. You know, I think that's the whole point of that VAR. I think, you know, it's, it's being brought in to, to eradicate that kind of, that mark, that, those errors. Um, and, you know, we've done a press conference with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer this morning. Jose Mourinho's comments were put to him. Frank Lampard said something similar yesterday. Um, and, and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer had a list ready to hit back. You know, he's got three or four decisions that he thinks have gone against him. You know, he mentioned a, a possible red card for Mark Noble, um, a possible red card for the challenge on Mason Greenwood against Southampton, a penalty that was given against Spurs and overturned. So, you know, all these managers have got grievances. I, I don't think that there's any particular... Um, I don't think United have been particularly lucky this season in the way that anyone else has been particularly unlucky. I think that they've had decisions go for them. I think they've had decisions go against them, same as everyone else. And Rob, like with relation to obviously rumours um, in the press lately, I've seen um, that Marcus Rashford and um, Thomas Tuchel apparently was hoping about recruiting Marcus Rashford to PSG. Like, is there much weight in that in that rumour that PSG there is interest from PSG with Marcus? Well, no, I mean I wouldn't know much about. PSG's um, transfer targets, but you know, they want the best players in the world and undoubtedly Marcus Rashford is one of those. You know, in the past, Manchester City have looked at Marcus, um, Barcelona last summer were looking at him. You know, it would be no surprise this summer if PSG were looking at him because he is that good. Um, you know, I think from Marcus's point of view, I think after he signed that new long-term contract, I think at the moment he's, he's quite settled. I think there probably was a period when he was playing for Jose Mourinho when that wasn't the case. Um, you know, he wasn't playing as regularly as he would like, um, you know, perhaps he felt that the football, the style of football didn't really suit his, his talent. Um, I don't think that's true now with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. I think Ole has done a very good job of getting those players on board, um, getting them on side with the way he wants to play football, the way that he wants to run the club. And I think, you know, looking now, um, I think Marcus, he looks to me like a, a player who's very, very happy at Man United. And even if PSG were to come calling in the summer, I don't think he would be particularly tempted um, now, whether that's true for the rest of his career, I don't know. You know, Marcus Rashford is that good that he could play anywhere in the world. And if he holds those ambitions to maybe go and play in Spain or, or one of the top European clubs, you know, I, I wouldn't doubt that, that he could um, facilitate that move. But I think now, at the age he is, the, the importance that he's got at his, his boyhood club, I think that we can expect him to stay for a, a few years yet. I know this is a United show, but it would be it'd be rude not to ask you about it since you cover Manchester City as well. The, the the case with financial fair play, City's ban has been overturned. Now, I'm not going to ask you to get into the legalities of that because at the end of the day, that's for the sports lawyers around. But how do you think it affects financial fair play in the long run? Because there's a lot of clubs who are what you would call maybe below the elite who could really benefit if financial fair play was scrapped. Do you think of Newcastle, if this takeover eventually does go through, with no financial fair play, that could accelerate their progression. Do you think clubs like Newcastle in that bracket will now lobby UEFA and say, look, you need to change this because it's clearly unfair? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think there's a, quite a strong chance that, that the financial fair, fair play rules will, will get a, a good going over in the, next, in the next few weeks and months because of this decision. I think we'd probably have to wait for the cast decision, the, the reasons behind that decision to be published because, you know, there are two things going on here. If, if cast say that none of these things were proved, then, you know, the financial fair play would, would be able to exist, but would probably need tinkering with. If cast say that, you know, City have, have breached all these rules, but the fact they weren't prosecuted was because of this five-year time barred rule, um, then that's a different, a different matter. Um, I think that the, the feeling within football is that the financial fair play rules are a good thing, but are not fit for purpose at this moment. You know, I, I think that they, ideally, they want to look after the health of football clubs. They don't want, you know, take Newcastle, for example. They don't want Newcastle be t to be taken over with millions and billions of pounds pumped into them. And then an owner just decide he's not bothered anymore and run off and leave Newcastle in ruins because that would ruin a football club and it would ruin a city. And that, that can't be allowed to happen. I think that the danger with financial fair play as it stands is that with, with a team like Manchester City, you know, City see it 
privately as, as a set of rules that want to keep the elite elite and they don't like people gate crashing that club. You know, the likes of Man United, Barcelona, Real Madrid, the established European elite, obviously for their own um, ambitions, don't want more clubs coming in and be able to match their transfer fees and their, their wages. So I think they need to find a, a balance between those two things. I'm, I am all for protecting football clubs. You know, a club just down the road from me, Bury or no more. And that is an absolute tragedy. They're a club that I covered a lot when I was starting out as a journalist. And it's, it's devastating really to, to see Bury not exist and, and a, a town really that may never recover from that. Um, but also I, I think it's important that, that football clubs are allowed to, to grow and compete and expand. Um, you know, Manchester City is a, is a case in point. Um, you know, they have, their owners have only have not only redeveloped Manchester City, um, they've also redeveloped that that area of Manchester, an area of Manchester that was um, that was dying. Really, you know, the, the way that they've regenerated that area of Manchester is has been incredible. So, you know, I, I think there needs to find UEFA need to find a balance with those rules, and I don't think that we have that at the moment. Absolutely, um, and like with the financial fair play, like again, as you said, like the, the balance needs to be there, and like obviously with the traditional clubs like you have your United you have your Real Madrid still you know, Barcelona and Bayern Munich so they're established but then obviously like new kids on the block i.e. being Man City and Newcastle potentially they could come in and you know it, it doesn't sit right with me still like like especially when I see in City get away with it almost you know and get like they, they said nothing they they said they've done nothing wrong but then they get a 10 million fine like that's if you've done nothing wrong why get fine you know it's I know it does, just doesn't sit well at me, do you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the in terms of the fine, I mean, I think Jose Mourinho said in his press conference that he thought that the the decision was disgraceful, and obviously that that word in particular made a lot of headlines because it was it appeared to be aimed directly at Manchester City. But I think the the wider point that he was making was that either either City are guilty or they're not. So if they're not guilty, you let them back in the Champions League and you say that you're not being fined. If they are guilty, you ban them from the Champions League and you fine them. You know, the fact that the Champions League ban has been overturned, but they've still been fined, suggests there's a little bit of a, a grey area there. Uh, from City's point of view, they, the fine has been delivered to them because they, they have been accused of not cooperating with UEFA in the investigation. You know, City say that they cooperate, they handed everything over, that when UEFA were asking for more and more, there was simply nothing left to hand over. And, and that was taken as, as not cooperating when City felt that they had. So, um, you know, with, with the cast decision, it's particularly complicated. I, I think that we need to wait for the cast decisions to be, to give a, a proper, um, you know, a proper conclusion on this because the cast decisions, while we've obviously, we've, everyone's seen the, the, the decision, the overall decision, and obviously it's made headlines. I think we need to wait for the, the decisions to make a real fair judgment on what's actually happened there. Talking about this summer's window from a United perspective, Jaden Sancho seems to be the, the primary target. My personal opinion is that the club should recruit another centre-back because I don't think long-term Lindelof is a good partner for Harry Maguire. You could argue if they're going to compete at the top of the Premier League and in Europe that a new left-back could be needed. I know Luke Shaw's had a rejuvenation in form, but he can be susceptible to injuries and it's a lot of pressure to put on young Brandon Williams to, to step up to that plate at this moment in time. Where do you think United need to recruit and how much money could they have? Because I know, again, I mentioned Mark again. <laughs> he, he came out last summer and talked about a net spend and he was absolutely pilloried by so many people saying, you're talking nonsense, you're just being negative. And in the end, he was spot on with the net spend. So do you think United will be operating with a tight net spend again this summer? It, it certainly won't be a case of throwing money at everything. Um, you know, United are very conscious of what it would look like in a post-coronavirus world to start throwing hundreds of millions of pounds at players. You know, I think United have handled themselves particularly well through the, through the pandemic, the way that they've treated staff, um, fans. They've done everything that they can to kind of help out where they can. Um, I don't think it, the optics of then spending 150 million on one player and paying him 500 grand a week, I think would look quite poor. And, and I think United are well aware of that. That said... United are in a, a position, a good position to, to build on what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has done already and move on to the next level. You know, not challenge for Champions League anymore, but actually challenge for the Premier League title and make, if they qualify for the Champions League, to actually get into the, into the last few rounds of that competition. So 
you know, while they don't want to spend an awful lot of money, they, they do still want to sign good players. Jaden Sancho is an obvious one. He's someone that they've looked at for a long time. Um, they believe that there is a realistic chance of getting him in the next transfer window. Um, they, I think they believe that Jaden Sancho wants to move back to England and United, I think, would suit him. The, the difficulty now would be to agree a fee for, for Jaden with, um, with Brushy Dortmund because he's got two, year left, two years left on his contract. Brushy Dortmund aren't in the mood to let him go on the cheap. Um, you know, last summer we were talking about a 150 million pound player. You know, he's not going to lose half of his value in one year, even with the pandemic. So United are going to struggle to to negotiate a deal. I think they're still quite confident that they can do that, but they'll have to get that right. Um, the stories about the, the 50 million ceiling, according to United, are wrong. So it won't be 50 million or nothing. But again, I don't think they, they want to pay hundred million pounds for a player. So we're looking at a fee between sort of 50 and a hundred million pounds at the moment. Brush Dortmund value him at around 130 million euros. So there obviously is still a, a gap there that needs to be overcome. Um, you know, if, if, if I was a betting man, I would say that there's a, a more than fair chance that Jaden Sancho will be a United player before next season. Um, but again, you know, United fans will know that these things, take twists and turns and don't believe it until he's holding up a scarf at, at Old Trafford. Um, in terms of other areas where they need to strengthen, I think you're right. I think a centre-half is probably, a, if it's not a priority, it should be. United have, have alerted agents around England and, and across the world that they are looking for, possibly looking for another centre-half. Um, you know, I don't think the balance is quite right there with, um, with Harry Maguire and, and Victor Lindelof, I don't think it helps that Victor Lindelof hasn't had a particularly good season. I think he was very good last season. I don't think he's really hit that form this year. And um, you know, there is a question mark over his long-term future as the first-choice centre back. Um, and I think it's right that that Solskjaer is looking for a, a left-footed centre half. You know, he's seen everyone's seen the, the, what he said to Nathan Aki at the end of that Bournemouth game. Tyrone Mings is another one. Um, you know, if, if he was to get relegated with Aston Villa, I wouldn't be surprised if United looked at him um, and, and, and sounded out whether he was interested in a move. Um, you know, the, the, the list of centre-halves that they've, they've um, they put together for Jose Mourinho, a lot of them are still on there. You know, um, Skriniar at Inter Milan, um, Romagnoli at AC Milan are, are players that they've been interested in for a long time and will continue to be interested in. So um, United aim every transfer window to sign about three players. They aim for, you know, whether it's four or two, but the, the, the three they're aiming for three every window. Um, the difficulty this summer is that no one really knows how the transfer window is going to react. Um, they don't know what the cost of players is going to be. They don't know who's going to be available. And, and it is going to be tricky for Ed Woodward and Matt Judge and the recruitment team to, to get these deals over the line because um, we're in, a, in an unprecedented situation. So um, you know, they, they have their targets. that They want to bring players in. The, the next step now is actually getting to getting together with clubs, negotiating those deals, and, and getting them over the line. And you maybe possibly think that, like, with to raise money for for transfers, will there be a few outgoings? I've seen a few reports that obviously Diogo Dalo may be on his way. You know, Chris Small and Alexis Sanchez. Do you think that would be kind of significant to United's transfer business in the incoming side of things? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that you know you touched on there about Mark Mark's story about net spend last summer. You know, United. Again, United won't just throw money at, at incoming transfers with, without trying to look to, to recoup some of that. And there are players there, you know, with the best will in the world, there are players there who, who probably need to move on. Um, you, know, you, you mentioned there Chris Smalling, Alexis Sanchez, who are already out on loan. Marcus Rojo um, is another one who, who Boca Juniors are interested in and um, he would quite like to go there by all accounts. Um, just still at the club, likes of Phil Jones, is not really in the first team picture. There is a difficulty with Phil in that he's he's got quite a few years left on his contract with that big contract that he signed, and um, it may be difficult for a club to to match his wages and the transfer fee that United would expect. Um, so there, there are there are players there who who might look to who might want to look to move on. Um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, I think, over the last few weeks, particularly since the break, um, has, has given everyone a very clear idea of his core group of twenty. There are other players outside that 20 who I don't think are going to figure that much next season and, and it may be the time for them to move on. Um, with relation to Paul Pogba, like he, he often devoids opinion and 
you know, there's always kind of, I suppose, the whole media circus around him in terms of his future and stuff like that. Um, like how, how, how would you assess Paul Pogba's return to the squad and do you believe he's a much happier person now at Manchester United? Yeah, I mean, he, he's firstly, in terms of form, I think he's been brilliant since he came back in. Obviously, I don't think Palace was his best game since he's come back, but he is still recovering and, and getting to full fitness. But I think in general, he's been very, very good. Um, I think we've perhaps seen him keep things a little bit more simple than he has done in the past. You know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has worked with him quite hard uh, you know, about the need to recycle the ball and, and get it moving quickly. You know, give it to someone, get it back and wait for the ideal chance to shoot or to hit that big diagonal 50-yard pass instead of kind of forcing things that we've seen him do maybe under Jose Mourinho a little bit and lose the ball more than he should. Um, in terms of his future, you know, the, the noises coming out of his camp are that he is as, as, about as happy as he's been since he joined the club. You know, that there is no hiding from the fact that he has been unhappy at Man United since um, in the last couple of years. Um, he has had his head turned by interest from Real Madrid and, and a move back to Juventus. You know, we all saw him last summer say that he thought it was time for a new challenge. Um, you know, his, his agent, Mino Raiola, has been particularly vocal in, um, in some of the things he said about a move away. So, um, you know, there, there has been tricky periods, but I think now um, he is about as happy as, as, as he has been. I think that's partly down to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, uh, the way that he's handled him and managed him. Um, you know, obviously, they're, they're two that know each other from the reserves when, when Ollie was there previously. Um, in terms of his future as well, I don't, I don't think there's much of a market for him at, at the moment. You know, he's got a year left on his contract and United have got an option for another 12 months that they will exercise, meaning he's got two years left. You know, for someone like Paul Pogba, you're talking about you know, £150 million and a wage packet that's around £500,000 a week. So I don't think there are many clubs in the world that can afford that at the moment. Um, particularly the clubs in Spain, Real Madrid are the, the ones we've heard mentioned, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if Real Madrid didn't do that much big summer business because of the financial side of the things and the impact of coronavirus. So, um, you know, Paul Pogba is fit again. He's back in the team. He's playing for a manager that he likes. Um, there isn't much of a market for him to move on elsewhere. And I think all these things have combined to, to make him quite settled at United. Obviously, the next step is to get him to sign a new contract. Um, United would like for that to happen. He's one of the best players in the world, in their opinion, and they want to have him for as long as possible. But they are very relaxed about it. You know, you're not talking about a player who's going to be free in 12 months. And we've still got two years left on his contract. We're kind of approaching a time where they would look to, to start negotiating with Paul to see where he's at and where he wants his future to lie. So um, I think we're still quite early in, in, in terms of a new contract, but I wouldn't be surprised if further down the line that was, that was done. I want to touch on Dean Henderson, obviously a goalkeeper who very highly rated in the English game and by United as well. Will he be under consideration to be the number one next season? Because the only criticism I have of Dean from the outside looking in is that any time he seems to be linked with being United's new number one, he seems to have a bit of a blip at Sheffield United. Do you think he's someone who has a realistic chance of becoming the number one next season? I think he's someone that they should consider, certainly. I think his form at Sheffield United and what he's done there deserves that, at the very, very least. Um, you know, you can't ask for a better loan spell, really. Um, you have just touched on it there, that the one thing missing with Dean, and I'm, I'm not saying that, he, that it's a criticism or he hasn't got it, but we don't know enough about his temperament, I don't think, at a huge, huge club. Um, you know, to be Manchester United goalkeeper is to have every single decision analysed you know, it's possible for a Man United goalkeeper to keep a clean sheet and still have an average game because, you know, maybe you haven't come for every cross that you should have done. Maybe your kicking wasn't great. So it's a, a new level of, um, of spotlight for, for Dean. Um, I, th I think from United's point of view, I think his progression has been quicker than they thought. I think that they thought that maybe... You know, in, in a couple of years down the line that they would be looking at him maybe to be number one. I think that Dean's performances and his form at Sheffield United demand that he's looked at immediately. You know, whether that happens or not this summer, I'm, I'm not particularly sure. I think from, from United's point of view, they would perhaps like him to go on loan again, um, whether it's Sheffield United or somewhere else, and get a, a bit more experience, perhaps another season as number one. You know, it's, it's very likely that Dean will play for England in the next year. I think he probably would have played for England in March had those games gone, away, uh, gone ahead. Um, and that's, again, another step in his career and see how he handles that spotlight. Um, what I would say about Dean is that, that he's very, very ambitious and he's very, very confident in his own ability. And he certainly won't be coming back to Old Trafford to be number two and sit on the bench for a season. Um, 
He wants to play. He knows the importance of playing games and developing his, his talent, uh, playing week in, week out. So I think Man United are faced with a decision and they're going to have to manage him very, very carefully because obviously they, they want him to be their number one. You know, Dean has said that he wants to be Man United's number one and England's number one. Um, but they're going to have to find the right path for him to make sure that, that United give themselves the chance to, to have him as their first choice goalkeeper because, you know, naturally other clubs are already looking at him. Um, Chelsea have looked at him, PSG, Bayern Munich, Juventus in the past have all looked at him. So there is a lot of interest in him. Um, and Dean, Dean will know that. So um, it's going to be one of the critical decisions for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer this summer, I think. Um, he's a huge fan of David De Gea. Um, he obviously gave him that big contract. Um, it's whether he feels like Dean is a better goalkeeper because um, there's no point bringing Dean back to sit him on the bench for a year and playing him in the Carlin Cup or the EFL Cup or the FA Cup games. Um, there's just no point. He may as well be playing in the Premier League every week. Um, so it's it's that is a big decision for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to make this summer. And do you feel like, with, obviously, with back to kind of United's transfer business side of things, like there's been kind of rumours that Jack Grealish um, is heavily linked to us. And before the pandemic happened, it was kind of nailed on that he was going to come to United. Do you feel maybe Aston Villa's relegation could maybe have an impact on that move? Or do you, know, do you think it's nailed on that we get no, I don't think it's nailed on, certainly. I think United's, a lot of United's interest in Jack Grealish has been driven by Solskjaer personally. He's a player that Solskjaer is a huge fan of. Um, you know, After he played so well for Villa at Old Trafford just before Christmas, um, Solskjaer asked the recruitment team to make an inquiry to, to Aston Villa in January about the possibility of bringing him in in January You know, at a time where it looked like Sporting Lisbon might not let Bruno Fernandes go. So the interest is there um, and Solskjaer is a, is a big fan. I think Jack Grealish's future is at United particularly is linked with Paul Pogba's. Um, if Aston Villa were to get relegated, I think Jack would, would look to move. I think he realises that he's at a stage of his career where you know, he's, he's kind of done his time at Villa. He's done his time in the Championship to get them back promoted. He has got ambitions to play for England and I think he will realise that if they got relegated, it would be time to move on um, to you know, a top six Premier League side. Whether United are that side, it's difficult to say at the moment. You know, you, when you look at someone like Jaden Sancho, it's very, very obvious where he would fit in. Um, you know, you could play him on the right-hand side of, of that front three. Um, you know, Mason Greenwood is still at an age where he needs to be taken in and out. So there is a spot there on the right for an established player to come in. When you look at Jack Grealish, you, you struggle to see where he would, where he would play regularly in that team. Um, obviously, it's very, very important to have strength in depth. And, and Jack is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful player and has played so well at, at Aston Villa this season. Um, it's whether he could be convinced to come in and maybe play a supporting role to the likes of Rashford on the left or Bruno in that number 10 role. Um, you know, Obviously, if, if Aston Villa get relegated, there is a possibility that, that their players may be available for a, a cut price fee. And if, and if the fee for Jack Grealish is a little bit lower than perhaps it would have been, then yeah, I think it's a sound investment. The same with with someone like Tyrone Mings. So, um, I won't, again, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Jack ends up being a Man United player, but I don't think it's nailed on that, that he signs for Man United. And, and just, just finally there for you, Rob, um, just with, in relation to United's ambitions, um, do you believe maybe next season, do you think that we're going to be challenging for the title or do you think maybe a top three finish would kind of be kind of more realistic expectations because, because obviously there's such a big gap um, towards Liverpool and Manchester City at the moment? I think from, from Solskjaer's point of view, he will want to challenge for the Premier League title. He, he's not going to go out on a limb and sort of say they are ready to leapfrog City and Liverpool because at the moment, I think it's fairly clear that they are streets ahead of, of anyone else in the Premier League. Um, I think what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will be keen to do is not let this momentum that he's built up go to waste. You know, he's, he's developed, he's found a very sound starting eleven. You know, you can't really argue about the form that they've shown. And I think he'll be very, very keen to build on that with new signings and go into next season with that same kind of mentality. Um, if the right players come in, if Jaden Sancho comes in and another centre-back comes in, possibly one more, I think United should see themselves as Premier League challengers. You know, it's, it's something that will probably come back to bite me next season. But, um, you know, that is United's ambition. All this, you know, challenging for the top four, you know, winning domestic cup competitions and nothing else, you know, ultimately that is not good enough for Manchester United. Man United need to be challenging for the, the Premier League title and challenging for the Champions League every single year. That's where they should be. Um, I think if the right players come in, 
I think next year we might be able to see United push City and Liverpool a bit further. Um, you know, maybe get into the final weeks, months of the season where United still have a realistic chance. Um, I would be surprised if United won it next year, I'll be honest, even if they had new signings come in because Liverpool are streets ahead, City are streets ahead at the moment. Um, but I, if there were, the right players were to come in, I think there's a chance that, that United could be the next team to really, really push them, uh, along with Chelsea probably. Absolutely. And I hope, really, like as a, like a big Man United fan, I'd, I'd love to see us challenge for a title sooner rather than later. I think, obviously, we've went seven years without a title and I suppose growing up, it's, I've been used to success and I suppose for any Man United fan, especially this season, it's been tough, obviously, seeing Liverpool going on and winning the league. Like, you know, but like I suppose football happens in, in stages and hopefully do you know, next season, especially under Raleigh, we can definitely even mount a title challenger, just put more pressure on City and Liverpool. That, you know, I'd love to see that myself. Um, Rob, thanks very much for coming on um, this morning. It means it means a lot to us here to be the armchair kickoff to dedicate your time to coming on this morning. Um, and you know, like you're doing great, obviously, with your platforms, with ESPN, and like it means a lot for someone like yourself to come on and, and have a chat with us this morning about United. You're welcome. Appreciate you taking the time to invite me, and uh, it was great. Thanks a lot. No problem. And look, this will be available, lads, on YouTube, um, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts coming soon. And again, we have United show on Monday um, reviewing Manchester United versus Chelsea and uh, previewing the final game of the season. Thanks very much, everyone, for watching. And we will be back again.